Okay, welcome everyone to our Modern Economy series. I'm Cheryl, the VP of Venture at YAI. Today, Melissa and McCullough will be talking about sustainability in the context of living today. However, before we get started, let's go over some more. First off, if you can, please have your camera on out of respect for our speaker. This ties into our second norm, which is staying engaged throughout the entire talk. Third, please keep messages in the chat appropriate and relevant. If you do send an appropriate, inappropriate message, we will have to remove you, and we don't want to have to do that. Um, the fourth norm is more just for your information. We are recording this seminar and will be uploading it to our YouTube channel. Last but not least, please enjoy our speaker series. Next, Ian Chen, YEI's co-founder as well as COO and president, will tell you a little bit more about our organization. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to our first of four exciting speakers we have in store for all of you this week. <clears throat> our events team here at the YEI is thrilled for the coming week, and we hope you're excited for our next year's speakers. Just a little bit of information about the YEI. YEI is the world's largest coalition of high school economics clubs. We're a student-run 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering youth entrepreneurs and economists with pathways towards careers in finance, eco economics, and business. Outside of our public events and webinars like this one, we offer a wide-ranging set of resources and opportunities exclusively available to our chapters and members, including our two flagship competitions, economics and financial literacy curriculum, and our initiatives that provide service and research opportunities. Over the past year, we've impacted the lives of over 1,200 students and distributed $1,500 in prizes and established chapters from all across the nation and abroad. As we continue to expand, our team is committed to opening new doors for our members and students and empowering students to find and explore the passions in their passions in economics and finance. If you want to know more about the YEI, please check out our website at theyei.org and follow us on Instagram and, and like our Facebook page. Now Cheryl, our VP of Events, will introduce our speaker, Melissa McCall. McCullough. Ms. McCullough is the Senior Sustainability Advisor for the Environmental Protection Agency and an LEEDAP, a professional under the U.S. Green Building Council's Leadership in Engineering and Environmental Design Program. She has been studying sustainability and believes that it is the key to environmental, human, and economic well-being. Next, she will address the basics of sustainability, system thinking, and its implications for business. Please welcome Ms. McCullough. Hello, hello. I'm going to share my screen with you all now. And um, let me just get over to my. Oh, yep. Let's see. There we go. Can you all see my screen now? Uh oh. Yep. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, and, and you can hear me okay? I think you turned off your video. Uh -oh. Can you not hear me? We can hear you. You can? Yeah. Okay. So we're all good? Wait, I think I can't. you can turn off your camera. We can't we can see your slides but we can't see you. Oh okay. Um I think it did that automatically when I did it. That's okay. I'll turn my when I turn my slides off, I'm sure it'll come back. Okay. 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 Um so today I wanted to talk to you about sustainability and um I want to do it a, a from a, an economic perspective. But in order to really do a decent job of that, I need to talk about some of the basics because that will help you put it into context. So I work at the Environmental Protection Agency. And before the EPA was uh, in, in place, before we were created, the industries that put out pollution figured if they just diluted enough they said dilution is the solution to pollution and they figured if they just you know had enough water to dilute it in or enough air to dilute it in that it would take care of itself and what we discovered that was that that's not the case when you put a lot of, a, of pollution into the air or the water bad things happen 
Um, the first picture showed the Cuyahoga River, which caught on fire in 1969 and was a real wake up call for uh, people to think maybe that's not uh, maybe that's not working. Maybe we need to do something about these chemicals that we're putting into our water and into our air. This is a community where the coal burning facilities in the in the valley um, ended up with a with a weather inversion getting trapped in that valley and, and killing a lot of people, sickening a lot of people and killing a lot of cows. But another thing besides just the pollution that we put out that we impact that creates an impact on on the planet is how much of, of resources that we that we use. And um, so one of the things, I don't know if you all have heard about the ecological footprint, but one way to measure how much of an impact we have on the planet is to go through this sort of assessment where you look at, you know, what kind of, of um, fossil fuel use does your lifestyle use? What kind of food do you, do you eat? Do you eat a lot of meat, for example? Do you eat a lot of, you know, um, fast food or, or single use, um, single serving uh, packaged food. What kind of housing do you have? Do you, you know, do you live in a big house with a few, few number of people? And what kinds of, of goods and services do you buy and then throw away? Very often, um, you know, half of what we buy is gone in, in six months, 90% of what you buy is gone in a year in terms of packaging and boxes and, and just disposable goods, and all of those goods um, took resources to to create them, to transport them, and to get rid of them. So we are five percent of the global population, and we have twenty five percent of the greenhouse gas emissions, and we use twenty five percent of the resources. So here you can see what my footprint is like. Um, measured in how many acres of the planet does it take to support my lifestyle. As you can see, I live a pretty green life. I'm the yellow footprint and the country average is the blue. So I do pretty, pretty well. But still, if everybody on the planet lived like me, we'd still need nearly three planets. So we are overspending our natural resources and our natural capacity of the planet to clean itself. And obviously, we cannot keep that up. We only, we only get one planet. So if you want to think about sustainability, um, and, and if you talk about sustainability, if you just break it into you know, the ability to sustain what we do, you can see that it's really about the big picture. We want to look at how what we do impacts the planet and the community outside of us. Um, we want to talk, take the long view. Uh, when the people started dumping pollutants into the river, they didn't think, well, what's going to happen when more and more industries start dumping into that river? Uh, they certainly didn't think, let's, you know, let's see if those chemicals float on the surface, they might catch on fire. It's also about being inclusive and fair, and that's uh, evidenced by the fact that our country uses a quarter of the world's resources, even though we're only 5% of the, of the population. The, the, um, the, the planet has only so much capacity, and, and if we don't fairly distribute those and use those and think about the long view in terms of future generations, um, not only does that hurt future generations, but it also creates problems that unfairness itself creates problems. And we're seeing that now as we see um, people who didn't contribute to climate change hardly at all. And yet they're the ones who are being flooded out and in places like the Northern Marianas Islands where they're having to leave their historic lands or Native Americans who are too close to the shoreline and having to move their native land. So it really comes down to can we live the way we are living? Can it continue forever without harm or without running out of resources? Very often you hear people say, oh, sustainability is a three-legged stool where we want to balance economy, environment, and social equity. But in fact, 
if you think about it in terms of functions, an economy cannot survive unless it is within a society that is a, a, a sound and functioning society. And that society cannot function unless it's within a planetary or resource um, environment that provides what it needs. As the American Lung Association would say, if you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And so if we don't have the air to breathe, that's healthy, and the water to drink, that's healthy, and the food to grow, that, that's healthy, then we cannot, as a society or an economy, survive. This is because of something that we call ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are basically the jobs that nature does for us. And you see down in the right-hand bottom corner, um, soil. Soil is an incredibly rich, dynamic ecosystem that breaks down plant matter and vegetable matter and, and dead bugs and that kind of thing and turns it into something that will actually grow food and grow trees and, you know, trees turn into houses and food turns into human beings and other animals. Um, you know, we have cycles in the world that uh, every bit of water that's on the planet now has been here from the very beginning and and it is constantly you know flowing downstream evaporating coming down as rain so it's this constant replenishment and moving it back upstream in a natural in a natural cycle everything in nature moves in cycles and oops um John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And we can see that when we look at any food web for any, um, for any, any needed um, animal or vegetable resource. And here you see the food web for the Atlant Northwest Atlantic cod, which is a huge food source. Uh, all of our fish sticks and fish sandwiches have been or are made out of cod um, or pollock. Um, and you see that this this huge um, web of, of life includes all the fish above and all the little the little um, you know starting down with the with the bottom and the algae and the little copepods and, the, and then it goes up to the octopus and the you know whelks and the squids and the small fish and they end up in with the cod. So part of what I really like about this food web is that it's a simplified food web of the Northwest Atlantic. But it shows that all these things are connected. And if some of these threads get broken by the loss of huge, you know, swaths of food for the for higher up the food chain, then the food chain can collapse. So we need to think about the systems. We need to think about how things interact, how things are connected to each other. And I'm giving you here a, a good example of what happens when you don't think about the big picture, how are things connected, in the long view, how are things going to pass over time. And, and in the 1950s, in, in Borneo, they were having a lot of trouble with um, malaria. And malaria, of course, was spread by mosquitoes. And you can see it in the, the way that the, the place is that that's pretty much a big, giant mosquito farm. So what they found was that they thought, well, we know what we'll do. We've got this new chemical called DDT. And we'll spray it. It'll kill all the mosquitoes. It'll take care of the problem. Well, what they didn't think of when they sprayed the DDT was what's it going to kill besides the mosquitoes. One of the things that it killed was the little wasps that would lay their eggs on caterpillars and eat up the caterpillars and keep the population of the caterpillars down. Consequently, those caterpillars ate what they normally eat, which is the thatch roofs off of the houses. So the, the World Health Organization thought, well, that's okay. Um, we don't have to worry about that because we'll just take the thatch roofs off um, or we'll replace the, the eaten up thatch roofs with metal roofs. And what they found then was that it rained a lot and the people who lived in the houses 
couldn't sleep because it was always raining and the metal roofs were like having a, a, um, a drums beating over your head. So that was one downside they did not foresee. What they also didn't think about was the fact that when you put DDT in the ecosystem, it doesn't just kill the target insect. It's going to also poison and, and contaminate all the other lower life forms. And again, these are the bottom of the food chain, right? So all of these kinds of bugs got contaminated with DDT. Well, the next level up in the food chain is the geckos, and the geckos ate up the insects, and then the cats ate the geckos. Well, when the cats ate the geckos, it killed the cats because it's magnifying up the food chain. Every level of the food chain that it goes up, the DDT burden is greater. And so after a cat eats so many, you know, geckos, it gets a pretty, pretty bad dose of DDT and it kills it. So what happened then was that the, the cats that used to keep the um, mice and the rats populations under control, the, mat, the, the, the rodents went crazy and they ended up with typhus and sylvatic plague instead of malaria. And so they took one problem and turned it into a whole lot of other problems. What the World Health Organization ended up doing was working with the Royal Air Force and dropping in, air dropping in cats. And this goes down to um, the, the, um, the big picture and long view consequences. And that is, you know, these side effects that they didn't think of. I love this description by Garrett Hardin. It says, side effects are consequences you didn't think of, the existence of which you will deny for as long as possible. So again, they didn't think about the system. They didn't think about the, the um, cascading problems. And, and that they ended up with worse problems than when they started, which they could have solved a lot of just by making um, nets available, mosquito nets to, available to put around people's beds, for example, which is what you see in a lot of places now. So it comes down also then to what do we need in order to live our lives? What resources do we need? What protections do we need? And how would nature do it? Nature's a good, uh, a good um, example because nature adapts to changing conditions. The book Natural Capitalism, which I would heartily, heartily recommend to you guys because it talks a lot about sustainability and, um, and, and economics. Um, the authors describe nature as a test bed for eons where whatever didn't work was recalled by the maker. So nature has functions that um, take place in a lot of different areas. As an example, nature has natural renewable energy. There's a lot of opportunity. Every, you know, coal and, and natural gas were once plants, which was once just water and, and sunshine. So the sun provides pretty much most of the power that, that we have now. Um, but we can provide it with renewable energy. And that would be, um, you know, endless endless supply, no, no in, increase in fuel costs over time. And as I love the, the, I love the quote, the, a spill is called the nice day. And you can take it anywhere. You don't have to worry about um, you know, having a coal mine or, or a gas or gas well nearby. In nature, diversity is both necessary and beautiful. And, and believe it or not, beautiful is, is an important thing um, for certainly for human beings. And we have what's known as biophilia. We have a, a natural love and need for nature. But diversity is really important. If you throw your mind back to that picture of the, of the uh, food web, um, where, where you find something comes in and impacts part of that food web, say one particular uh, strain of algae is a, a, affected by a disease that might come through and, and nearly all of them die out. Well, there's diversity so that there are other things that those animals can eat while that 
uh, population of algae is coming back. So that diversity um, provides strength in a system. And um, so that's, that's true in nature, that's true in human societies and a lot of other ways. Nature uses life-friendly chemistry. So you may not, this is a Kevlar vest, a bulletproof vest. And what you may not know is that Kevlar takes a lot of energy and a lot of um, caustic and toxic chemicals. And, and it, you have to boil it at a very high temperature, so it's also very um, energy, uses a lot of energy. Meanwhile, a thread of spider silk is actually stronger than a thread of Kevlar. Uh, but, but spiders make spider silk at, at ambient temperature out of bugs. So how can we mimic that? And there is an entire field of science called biomimicry where we figure out um, and the biologists and work with chemical engineers or, or engineers to figure out how can we provide the same kind of function that nature does in a way that then gives us a, a, a more effective and, and efficient and life-friendly way. Nature also creates this waste equal food cycle everywhere. And you see that when you see a tree come down or when you take your food scraps and you turn them into compost. In nature, waste equals food. And that means that you never run out of those raw materials. There's this constant creation and destruction going out, going on. And finally, nature sustains, and, and it's sustained in both senses of the word sustain. If you look it up in the dictionary, it talks about nourishment, and it talks about continuing over time. And nature does both of those things for us uh, if we just do not interrupt it and damage it to the point where it cannot provide those functions anymore. So a lot of people believe that that um, doing living sustainably and and having economic advancement and growth is incompatible. And Harvard Business Review has done a couple of, of the evaluations of those businesses which are more sustainable. This one in 2016 was the second follow-up that they did to their first study. And what they found was that businesses that are striving for sustainability actually do much better financially than businesses that do not. And they do that both in terms of stock price and in terms of profit. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is that they have a competitive advantage because in order to be able to be sustainable, you have to figure out how to do what you need to do and nothing more. So they engage with stakeholders and figure out how to provide what the, their customer wants without wasting things. And that's important. They foster innovation. Again, they avoid waste. Um, a good example was the uh, Dow Chemical sent their uh, their bottom level, their, their workers, a message and said, we want to save energy. You guys are out there doing the work. How can we do it? And, and within a month, they had a lot of different plans because the people who are out there doing the work knew where the inefficiencies were. They found them, they targeted them, and they were saving, you know, millions within a, a year. So having that innovation, Having that innovation for things like biomimicry, um, other things like that. Innovation means that kind of growth that you want in the positive direction. It also improves risk management. And, and that's really important because risk means that you're, it, partly that you're gambling with what you're going to do. Uh, partly it's trying to find the things that will impact your business going forward looking into that long view. Where are the risks to our business? And I'm going to go into that a little bit in just a minute. It also improves the financial performance. Again, not, not wasting as much, 
finding things that you may have to pay for that you don't that you don't really want to. If you can avoid the use of caustic chemicals or, or toxic chemicals, that means you don't have to buy expensive chemicals. You don't have to dispose of expensive chemicals. And a good example for this is where um, there was a uh, there was a plant a, a plant that made chairs in Germany where they had set very strict guidelines for toxins. And this Herman Miller plant was making chairs, and they wanted to send the the trimmings from the fabric for these chairs to the landfill. And they said, you cannot send this fabric to the landfill. It's toxic. And so Herman Miller shut down the plant and they reevaluated all of the chemicals that they were using. And they were using hundreds of chemicals to make these chairs and, and to dye the fabric for these chairs. They ended up reevaluating how they did this. And they reevaluated the the, uh, the the chemicals that they were using. What those chemicals did, they discovered that they could re-engineer the the dyeing process. They could cut down to a handful, a couple of handfuls. I think it was like a dozen chemicals that were non-toxic. And they ended up being able to use their fabric trimmings for compost and mulch in their gardens and they ended up having cleaner water coming out of the plant than going into the plant because the fabric also worked a little bit like a filter. So they improved their financial performance by they didn't have to buy a lot of toxic chemicals. They didn't have to, to, to store them and dispose of them in a way that would cost more money. So that's an important thing. They also build customer loyalty, and you can see that a lot these days. People want to know what's the green choice, and, and it builds a lot of customer loyalty, but it also creates a way to build loyalty among the employees. Any time that you can avoid employee turnover, you are saving money because training and holding on to good employees is, is costly. And so if you can retain employees, then you're going to be come out financially ahead. And employees want to do something. They want to be in a business that they believe in. And a business that is striving for sustainability has found, or at least Harvard Business Review found, that striving for sustainability in business was attracting and engaging their employees. And, and that's an important thing for their bottom line. So I want to give an example here of one risk, and that is in order to maintain a business, you be, have to be able to have supply chains for the, for the raw materials that you're using to make your products or for, for example, food from farms to sell at a grocery store. And, and if we have those supply chains disrupted, then that disrupts the, the income streams or the resource to sell streams and that disrupts the business. And so we've seen a lot of this with COVID where, where we're not being able to um, ship things or supply chains are being disrupted and that's huge economic uh, impacts. Another risk is that of harms and liabilities. So back before we had EPA and the Superfund program, uh, a good example of, of one lack of foresight was at Love Canal, where a chemical company was taking a bunch of barrels of waste chemicals. Again, chemicals that they, that they bought, they used in processes. They ended up with these leftovers. They put them in drums. So first off, they wasted money buying chemicals that they then, at the end, had to, had to dis dispose of except instead of disposing of them in a, in a responsible way, they put them in drums that would rust and buried them in, in Love Canal. And they were there for 25 years. They, the drums rusted. They leaked into the water table. And people started getting really, really sick. 
And when they figured out what was causing it, they had to buy the entire neighborhood and move everybody out. Um, and so that creates then, if you're, if you're using those kinds of chemicals, you are creating harms and you're creating legal liabilities because that company was responsible for those sickness, that sickness and death. But on the, on the flip side of that, um, there are a lot of opportunities in thinking that way. For example, I'm going to give you this example of taking something that's a cost, a liability, a cost, and, and turning it into an opportunity. So in this example, there is a, a brew pub in Denver, and it was making beer, which of course takes grain. And when the grain was finished with the beer making process, they had to dispose of it, which was a cost. They, you, they had to pay to have it hauled away and, and do something with it. But, but you can't feed spent grain from beer making to livestock because they cannot digest it. So what they did was they started looking at it in a system way. And they ended up taking that liability and turning it into a supply chain. So this was an evaluation by the Zero Emissions Research and Initiatives group. And what they found was if they took that spent grain, they could do a number of things with them. They started with mushrooms. Mushrooms have a function in nature, and that function is to break carbon-hydrogen bonds. So when a tree falls in the woods, uh, it isn't the moss that, that helps break it down into soil. The first thing that has to happen is that the fungus comes in, breaks those hydrogen carbon bonds, and then it can finish breaking down. So what they found was they could grow mushrooms on those, on that spent grain, and the, and the mushrooms would help break down that grain. They could also make bread out of the grain, and they could grow earthworms with the grain. Well, bread and mushrooms are great to feed people at a brew pub. They could then take the mushrooms, they could then, um, excuse me, take the, the grain on which they grew the mushrooms. And at that point, it can be fed to the livestock. And so they used it to feed to the cattle and the, and the pigs, who again were eaten in the brew pub. They then took the manure from those two, and they put it in a digester, and they ended up making natural gas, which create, is, a, is a way to create energy. So they, the natural gas created heat, which could, which could heat up the mushroom growing place, or it could be used elsewhere for energy. And then the digester also could take the, um, the, the water runoff and use it as fertilizer for a garden, which they could use to feed people at the brew pub. And they could put it into algae basins, where then they would create a, a fish pond. And the fish pond would also be things that they could, you know, fish and chips for the for people drinking beer. They could take the algae water, fish water, and use that as fertilizer for the garden. And, um, and they could take those earthworms from the spent grain at the beginning they could create uh, enzymes from those, which are good screening products, or they could feed them to chickens, who could then become food for the, for the uh, food hub. And so you see, when they started thinking about the system in which that grain could be, it turned from a liability, a cost, to a whole lot of other businesses or other resources and and when people think about this kind of a system it can often be thought of in a a um, industrial ecology kind of way so one way of using this system without it being in this particular kind of resource is to either co-locate industries that can use each other's waste um, and design around those, or to create networks and and match kind of match 
waste.com for waste resources so that waste resources can be turned into, as in nature, waste equals food for another, for another industry. So thinking in terms of that network is a really efficient way of thinking in a very innovative business, how can I grow a business kind of a way. So Albert Einstein once said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them. And when we used to think in terms of from cradle to grave, we dig up a resource, we use it, we dispose of what's left over, we, we send our pollution downstream or off to somebody else. All we're doing is externalizing the, the cost which means that the, the industry is getting the benefit and the people who are breathing the pollution are, are, are uh, taking responsibility for the cost, which again, not fair. Albert Einstein also said, look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. And he was really much ahead of his time when he said that because now we know so much more about the circular economy and industrial ecology and biomimicry and a lot of ways that we can use the lessons of nature to be able to provide what we need and do it in a way that can be sustained over generations that can be both equitable to the people who are living in the world with us now and to be equitable for generations to come like the Native Americans would say they had they would look at a decision for the next seven generations and, and that's the kind of thinking that we need to have as we go forward so that we too can live in a sustainable world. So with that um, I hope that y'all have some questions and I will see now if I can turn my camera back on um, let's see, what's this mean? Start my video. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Okay. Fabulous. I see somebody named Bija. Yes. So we will now be moving on to the Q&A section. Again, my name is Dina Jane, and I am one of the coordinators at the YAI. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand in the participant. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. So, hi, Ms. McCullough. We have some questions that were submitted privately to me in the chat. So our first question is, how can businesses transition to becoming more environmentally sustainable? So a good way to start is to really evaluate where things are in your business. And so um, there, is a, there is a thing called the ISO 14,000. I don't know if you all have heard about that. There is another thing called Environmental Management Systems, or EMS. The upshot, though, is to really take stock, to figure out what you're doing. What are you creating? What resources are you using? How much electricity are you using? What kind of waste streams do you have? What kinds of resources and supply chains do you use? And once you have those, that data in front of you then, a sustainability expert can help you with figuring out for your for your business, where are you? Where are you wasting things? Where can you do resource replacement that would be cheaper, safer, uh, lower risk? And so, that would be the way to start. Uh, once you once you start with that, as a, a based on data, what doesn't get measured doesn't get changed. And so, you need to know where you start in order to know where you where you what you need to do. Got it. Yeah. So then, is there an example of any corporation that has greatly benefited from becoming sustainable? Oh gosh. Um, well, certainly the Harvard Business Review evaluated them 
I can't think of any. I can't think of any specific corporate examples right now. But if you Google business sustainability, you will get a lot of examples. Most most big companies have sustainability plans, and sustainability officers uh, right now are past. Uh, our past EPA administrator, Lisa Jackson, is now the sustainability director for Apple. So there are a lot of people who are specializing in that now for business. And, and they're doing that because business, you know, not to be unkind, but for the most part, business doesn't do business to be, to be generous to people. They believe they have a fiduciary responsibility to take care of nothing but their stockholders, and consequently, they they keep an eye on the bottom line. If it didn't pay off, they wouldn't do it. So somebody asked, uh, I don't remember if it was Ben or Jerry from Ben and Jerry's, but they said, uh, is it possible to have a sustainable business? And he said, well, first you have to have a business. Yeah. So oh, Aditya asks, will the actions we take today be enough to forestall the direct impacts of climate change, or is it too late? We are not going to prevent climate change because climate change is already happening. We already know that we've got more severe storms, we've got heat waves, fire in Siberia. Um, but what we do now is is to prevent the worst from happening. We can, if we act, we can keep the the rise in, uh, rise in climate uh, temperature within one and a half degrees centigrade. And that's what we need to do. So we need to do it. Oh, for sure. So kind of going off to the work of the EPA, uh, what work does the EPA do specifically to kind of incentivize the E portion of ESG? And if you could also tell the our attendees more about the ESG, ESG as well. Uh, I, okay, I'm sorry, because you're, you're a little garbly. I hope I'm not garbly, and it might be my VPN, but um, could you repeat that question? Yes. So the question was, what work does the EPA do specifically to help incentivize the E portion of the ESG? And then could you also explain what the ESG is? The ESG? Yes. I'm not sure what you mean by ESG. Um, it is the... Oh, the, US, the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> The SDGs. <laughs> uh, you you threw me. Sorry, okay. Sorry. No, that that no that the UN. Um, definitely, definitely. Sorry. So many acronyms. It's hard to keep track. Um, yeah. So so one of the things about EPA is that EPA has to. We only have the authority to do what we have laws that tell us to do. So. It, we have laws like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act that authorize us to do things or direct us to do things to protect air and water. Uh, we have uh, Superfund laws and Brownfield laws. We also have some laws that sort of set out more general kinds of, of goals and, and requirements. And so we have other things that we do that um, that will say, you know, we're helping with the Superfund law wants us to help with the, the community revitalization, for example. So we have some programs that will we're, are helping with that. That's a more of a voluntary thing or an informational thing. Yeah. So we do have we have we, we do what we need to do and, and can do within the laws that tell us what to do. And we provide a lot of information. Um, emissions inventories and information about what kinds of, of uh, pollution transport there is and a lot of modeling and so that kind of information is really 
very, very important. And a lot of countries actually use our information or our models. And so in that way, we, we advance those goals. Um, but there are other things that we cannot do because we do not have the authority, which is why EPA alone cannot solve the world's environmental problems. We can't solve the country's environmental problems because we don't have the authority to do all those things. And, and, and lawmakers sometimes differ about how much we ought to do. Um, so, you know, it's very important for everybody to pull their share. It's important for, for businesses to work on being more sustainable. It's important for local governments to work on trying to make places more walkable and bikeable and transitable uh, so that we don't you know, create create a lot of, um, right now, climate gases are about 40% uh, from transportation, maybe not. It, anyway, transportation is now the first largest fraction of sources. And, and, and we cannot, and, and that's largely driven by vehicle miles traveled. EPA has no authority over vehicle miles traveled. We have created cafe standards that say cars have to be more efficient, miles per gallon, more miles per gallon. We have created fuel standards that have said, you know, you need to make fuels cleaner. We have set diesel standards that say diesel trucks have to be cleaner. But we couldn't do anything to keep people from uh, going from train transport of goods, which is very efficient, to largely trucks which is less efficient and much more highly polluting. We couldn't stop local governments from creating zoning laws that created sprawl, which made people drive more. So a lot of the gains that we had through fuel regulations and cafe standards uh, were undone by, by um, sprawl and increased vehicle miles gap, uh, travel. On the other hand, we do have the opportunity we, we created, for example, the Energy Star program. And the Energy Star program, by creating the information, by providing the information, enabled people to make better decisions. So again, there's so many fronts on which we need to address this, which is the really cool thing, because as you guys come into the field, there are so many different places that you can make a really positive impact. Thank you so much for that. Well, that wraps up our Q&A. Thank you so much for all your questions. Now, Shristi, our other events coordinator, will complete the event. Thank you all for attending day one of our Modern Economy Speaker Series. And a big shout out to Ms. McCullough for speaking with us today. Laura will be hosting UVA Professor Anton Kornick at 1 p.m. Pacific time. He'll be talking about the private and social costs of COVID-19 from his paper, COVID Externalities. On Wednesday at 3 p.m., we'll be hosting Rakesh Bora, a professor at UPenn, who will be talking about the overview of economics in a pandemic. And on Friday at 1 p.m., Dan Godin, a professor at NYU, will be talking about investing. We encourage you guys to attend all the days as you learn something new and insightful. And we'll be sending a follow-up email sometime later today, so make sure to Fill out our feedback form to receive the email if you haven't filled out our RSVP form. And the link is bit.ly slash modern econ feedback. Thank you.